Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next session of the Inspiring Women Transforming Science virtual event from the Ross and Franklin Society. My name is Phelan, Senior Editor at Gen Biotechnology, Gen's sister peer review academic journal publishing original research and perspectives. And it's my pleasure to be moderating this session and introduce our speaker, Dr. Judy Absalon. Dr. Absalon is an adult infectious diseases physician and experienced clinical researcher with more than 20 years of experience. She has spent the past 15 years contributing to the development of antiviral drugs and vaccines. Dr. Absalon joined GSK in October 2021, where she serves as Vice President and Clinical Sciences Disease Area Lead of Infectious Diseases and Virology. Prior to joining GSK, Dr. Absalon was a Senior Medical Director in Vaccines Research and Development at Pfizer, where she contributed to the licensure of a sero group B meningococcal vaccine for adolescents and young adults, led a group B streptococcal maternal immunization program, and led the clinical development team for a novel RNA vaccine for the prevention of shingles. In 2020, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Epsilon was a core team member on the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine clinical development program. And it's our pleasure to have her with us today. Dr. Epsilon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Faye, um, and I appreciate the invitation um, uh, to speak today. I think what I wanted to do, um, and hopefully we can have a nice discussion, but what I wanted to start off with was really to talk about how I got here, um, how my path uh, to becoming a um, clinical researcher in pharma, um, and uh, hopefully we can spend the end of the discussion talking about some of the challenges being a, one, a woman of color um, in this space. So I am a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York um, to immigrant parents from Haiti. I have always wanted to be a physician. This was something that um, I remember wanting to do from uh, single digits. Um, part of that need was because I saw the pattern in my family. So we have physicians in the family. And so it wasn't um, something that was unusual. And I think this is a theme that's important. Uh, when I talk to uh, younger um, girls and, and young women in their journey in STEM or in medicine, um, <clears throat> after college and med school, um, I spent a bulk of my career training in New York City at Columbia University um, and Harlem Hospital. I completed my, uh, my internal medicine residency and my infectious disease fellowship um, at Columbia and part of my ID fellowship at Harlem Hospital. I then, um, because I had always wanted to have a large impact on infectious diseases, I completed a master's in public health at the end of my fellowship in epidemiology. I then stayed on faculty at the School of Public Health um, at Columbia for several years before I transitioned into pharma. My first role um, was in HIV uh, drug development at Bristol-Myers Squibb. I had been working on um, HIV prevention research while I was at Columbia, um, particularly uh, doing work around sexually transmitted infections and the prevention and modification the prevention of HIV through the modification of sexual behaviors at the time. Um, many who start in academia will tell you, at least back then, that the transition from academia to pharma is not always easy. And so I wanted to stay in a space that I was comfortable with. And, and so I went on to BMS to do antiviral drug development um, and worked on HIV drug development, particularly um, doing one of the tr first trials uh, phase three trials in pregnant women, um, giving a uh, cocktail of medicines. After several years there, I transitioned back to New York and um, took a role in vaccines because I felt that that melded my um, interest in public health epi, but maintained my interest in infectious diseases. My family um, immigrated to the United States uh, in the 60s from Haiti. And so I've always understood the dramatic um, and sometimes fatal impact of infectious diseases, but also 
how we could prevent um, much of that harm through vaccines or medicines and certainly um, with antibiotics to treat uh, very simple um, infections. But I also understood the impact of lack of access. Um, and so I, I've always wanted to have a broader reach um, as a physician. I stayed um, in Pfizer vaccines for over a decade and had the opportunity um, to contribute to licensing uh, two vaccines, um, novel vaccines in, in epidemic and then unfortunately in pandemic settings. So the meningococcal B, serogroup B vaccine um, is a, uh, at the time we have, we've had uh, meningococcal uh, vaccines for, for children, but not for all of the serogroups. And serogroup B was one where um, that was increasing and impacted particularly young adults and adolescents, um, particularly those in, in college. And at the time that we were developing the serogroup B vaccine at Pfizer, um, there was an outbreak uh, around 2013 that lasted a few years at several colleges um, in the US. And the, the level um, of the outbreak was, was much higher than we, than we had seen in those regions. And luckily we had been in the process of um, developing this vaccine and through close collaboration with regulators, we're able to accelerate um, that, that development and successfully license the, the vaccine, which is now available um, for all um, college age uh, students and, and even younger adults. <clears throat> Towards the end of my uh, tenure at Pfizer, so in 2020, I think we all were um, similarly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and I had the opportunity with many of my colleagues at Pfizer to work on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, um, and that really was a huge accomplishment um, in my career, uh, but I think for, for many in the world, also a huge impact on, on everyone personally. I, at the end of um, 2021, uh, an opportunity at GSK became available uh, and allowed me to go back to drug development as opposed to uh, vaccines and biologics. And, I've been at GSK for the past two years, leading a team um, of excellent clinical researchers and expanding our infectious disease drug portfolio. Um, and here I'm spending more time working on strategy and big vision, uh, but it's, it's a great opportunity um, to be able to be at a company that has not only a large um, focus on infectious disease drug development, but also um, including HIV, but also has a large vaccines portfolio. So I've come full circle in a sense um, because I've, I've started in drug development. I spent a large part of my career in vaccines and now I've uh, circled back um, and it's given me a breadth of experience and knowledge that um, I truly appreciate. One of the things that I was asked to talk about um, today was really my perspective on being an African-American woman um, in this space. I think what has been um, interesting, uh, sometimes difficult, is, is being the only one in the room. Um, and I think as my career has progressed, I've learned to have a bigger voice uh, I think to a certain extent, I've become used to being the only person that looks like me in the room, um, but have tried over the years to increase those numbers through mentorship, through sponsorship, both during my work um, time, but also my personal uh, life. Um, one of the things that I think I've been lucky with, uh, and this comes from my family, is the reason I decided to be a math major in college, the reason I you know, decided to uh, go to medical school, the reason I've always continued to be in this space is because no one in the family made me feel like I couldn't. And one of the things that I've tried to do is I've taken on more senior roles um, in industry, in academia, um, I continue to teach periodically is uh, to encourage 
um, all students and all, you know, junior um, faculty or junior colleagues, but particularly women of color, I encourage them um, to keep going and to have confidence. I think that was one of the things that I needed to grow into. Um, and some of the work that I did at Pfizer allowed me to, to demonstrate um, to myself uh, what I could achieve. So my career is definitely uh, not yet over, but I've, I've learned quite a bit on this journey and I'm, I'm continuing um, to challenge myself, challenge the organizations that um, I'm a part of to do the best that we can to diversify um, the workforce. And because I spend all of my time working on clinical trials or speaking about clinical trials, one of the big issues in addition to having um, researchers that look like me is also having the appropriate re representation of um, diverse patient populations or and study participants in our um, clinical drug and vaccine development work. And so um, over the past couple of years, while I've been at GSK, what has been um, impactful is the time, the resource, and the conversation that the company spends on the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, both as it relates to clinical trials, as well as um, the employees who are part of the organization. The last thing I'll say is it, it occurred to me as I was preparing for this talk today that I've had the opportunity um, to work under uh, powerful women um, of various races and ethnicities. But when I was at Columbia, uh, the head of my infectious disease uh, program was a woman. The head of the ID Epi group that I joined as faculty was a woman. My first boss in pharma at BMS was a woman. Um, the head of our uh, Vaccines Research and Development Group at Pfizer was a woman. And the company where I am now is led uh, by a woman CEO. So I think I've been lucky in the sense that I've, I've seen female leadership um, and I've seen women of color in leadership positions, but there certainly aren't enough of us. And I take that as a um, action for myself every day to try to improve. So with that, I think that is a little bit of um, my journey and hopefully we can have um, some targeted discussion about what else needs to be done. Okay. Right. Thank you, Dr. Epsilon for that, that powerful description of your journey. And as you mentioned, here at the Rouse and Franklin Society, we're here to give voice to diversity and emphasize the importance of diversity. And that conversation is incomplete without intersectional identity. And as you mentioned, talking more about the challenges and also how to support other women of color, other individuals who do come from an immigrant background. And so what advice would you have for other individuals who are facing the results of that intersectional identity and the challenge, combinatorial challenges that come with that experience? Sure, that's a great question. It's a, it's a tricky one, right? It's hard. Um, it's interesting because I think a lot of times we're at, asked to be in one category uh, or another when, you know, I check a lot of boxes, right, for, for lack of a better way. And what I, I would tell people is to show up as your authentic self. Um, if I think about my trajectory and, you know, through lots of schooling, several different um, jobs, I'd probably say that this is the this is the time in my life where I feel my most authentic. Um, I'm a pretty transparent person, um, but over the years, I've definitely had to adjust um, who I am or how I uh, present myself in a room to fit others, uh, other sort of expectations. Um, and I think if you show up as your true authentic self, then 
you don't have to check a box. You, you, you know, I am um, a child of immigrant parents. I'm a black woman who was born in the United States. So I consider myself African-American, but I also consider myself Haitian American. Um, and obviously I'm a woman. So I, I now show up with all of those perspectives. Sometimes the, the conversations will lean you know, one way or the other, right? Sometimes I'm the only woman in the room and not the only person of color. Sometimes I'm the only person of color um, and maybe not the only woman. Um, so I, I think really it's just showing up as you are, um, which sounds quite simple, right? It sounds like a very basic thing to say to people, but um it's it's not so easy. I'm I'm hoping that it's easier for younger people to <laughs> to uh, to show up as themselves um, as we move through society. But but that allows you to to tap into all. It allows me to tap into all aspects of who I am. I love that showing up as your your authentic self, and it reminds me of this theme of of community that you had also brought up in your your um, discussion where. I, I believe you said nobody made you feel like you couldn't, yeah. which which is so, so wonderful. And a, a big topic of discussion is is mentorship and having people to look up to, people who look like you, who are able to support this journey. And so d did you have any key mentors that supported you in your journey and any advice in, in finding that community, supportive community? Sure, that's a great question. I mean, I think both mentorship and sponsorship um, are important, and I'll explain the difference. I think most people are for, uh, familiar with mentorship. I don't know that I had real mentors, right? So I had mentorship in some of my department heads and um, and uh, bosses who I, I think were excellent and guided me. But as I progressed in my career, I, I got to understand what true mentorship was. Um, and it is a little bit distinct from maybe having someone who you're working with in the same area day to day, right? And and oftentimes mentorship is um, sporadic is probably not the best word, but it's it may be infrequent, right? And it really I tell people that you should look for mentors early, and you should look for multiple mentors, right? And so in my early career, when I started to think about mentorship, I thought I would have one mentor and that would be it. And that person would guide me for the rest of my career. And in fact, you can have, men you should have multiple mentors that um, provide something different. So it may be someone who's in the same field. It may be someone who is a personal mentor. It may be someone that's guiding you to think about career on a broad scope. And it may be somebody who's helping you in a very specific way. Um, the other thing about mentorship is I tell people now uh, that it's bi-directional and the best mentorship relationships are ones where I'm, I'm doing something for the mentee, but the mentee is offering something to me. I think mentees don't often think that they have something to contribute, which is completely false, right? So when I teach, when I give talks to medical um, students, I get to hear what they're thinking about now, right? Because it's very different than what I'm thinking about. Um, you know, I get to learn about all the, the newer technologies and how they're using AI ML, even though I talk about that in my business, I don't necessarily know the practical day-to-day -day aspects of it, right? So there's always something as a mentee that you can offer. And I think when I talk and mentor younger or more junior people, when I say that and tell them that they too have something to offer, it it breaks down a wall because it's scary, right? It's, it's very intimidating to say, oh, I want to be this senior person and I want to just go up to them and say, hey, would you mentor me? And it's not always, you know, sometimes you have to find, you have to go through it a few times before you find a good fit. Um, but mentorship is key and it's important to start doing that early because then you learn how to do it well. Um, and I, I do try as much as possible to mentor people. And sometimes it's a one-off conversation. Sometimes it's a regularly scheduled conversation. 
Um, I always offer my contact information when I give a lecture um, to medical students, to, to fellows, to, you know, people that I talk to in pharma. Um, and the interesting thing is probably less than 10 or 15% of people actually <laughs> contact me um, because I think there is an intimidation factor. What am I going to say? How do I keep this going? Um, and so I try when I talk to people to um, get them not to to worry so much about that and say just just most senior people actually do want to talk to you and help. Um, and it's really a 20, 30 minute conversation. It, you know, and what I find it doesn't take anything away from me. And I often come out of the conversations learning something myself. The other thing that I would say is sponsorship, particularly um, when you are in a work environment, is critical. Um, and so you can have mentors who give you advice or kind of help shape you. But what's critical in career development is to have a sponsor, meaning someone who is in the room when decisions and opportunities, when decisions are being made and when opportunities are available to say, hey, I know someone that would be a good fit um, for that position. And I think that is one of the major areas where we start to see, um, in my opinion, the, the reasons for disparities um, in you know, all aspects of, of my work in pharma, in academia, um, because I think if you don't have someone who's bringing up your name or people are not aware of your capabilities and could essentially vouch for you, it makes it more difficult to get those opportunities. Um, and if you don't get the opportunities, you don't have the ability to show what you can do. Um, so mentorship and sponsorship. That's such a, a great portrait of the importance of, of networking, mentorship, and, and community as a whole. And I, I really love how you're emphasizing the importance of people at those higher titles making themselves approachable and putting your name on on that slide after your talk to to bridge that gap yeah. and make it more accessible for for these these medical students or whoever they are in their the beginning of their journeys to reach out and with that i know your your personal journey has come from medical school all the way to to gsk and i'm curious in how that journey came about, I imagine, is that something where when you entered medical school, you knew had an idea of where you wanted to go in terms of pharma? I, I imagine a lot of medical students are thinking, what, you know, what is next for me in the next yeah. few years of my career? So it's interesting because I think the tide has shifted a bit. Um, so when I was training, um, particularly in academia, going into pharma um, was not really something that was a great, you know, regarded as a great thing. Um, and, and most of us thought, well, I will stay in academia or I will do private practice or I'll be, um, you know, stay and, and see patients in hospital. And I did do that for a while. I think for me, so the, so the easy answer to your question is, no, I had no idea that I would end up working for, in pharma and that I would stay in pharma. What I've, the one thing I've, I've been consistent about in my career is I tend to do things that I enjoy. And so I knew I wanted to be a physician. You know, that was always a childhood dream. Um, but there's so many different avenues, right? And so I knew that I, I, I liked people but I wanted to help people on a broader scale. I like data. I like looking at data and I like numbers. So I was a math major in college and pre-med. Um, I also like to write and I do it well. So as I trained, and, and the thing about being a physician, at least in the United States, is a lot of it is, is, is there's a path that's laid out you know, for several years and then you have to make a decision. Um, and so I had time. And as I discovered epidemiology and discovered that I'd like to teach, I realized that I could do clinical research. And that actually brought together a lot of my personal interests, right? So 
I liked be, being a physician, but I didn't really like being in the hospital. Um, and so if I did clinical research, I could impact patients' lives, but I can also do the things that interested me. And, and that's how that started. Um, and then when the opportunity came um, to consider pharma, I made sure I started in an area that I was passionate about, which was HIV. And once I got there, um, I realized that some of the things that I wanted to achieve, which was, you know, how can I contribute to health care um, bigger, in a bigger way, right? So I can see patients in my community, which I did and I enjoyed, um, but that really is an individualistic touch. Um, and I had always wanted to be able to, to say that I contributed something that really could span beyond New York City, could span beyond the United States, because again, I came from a background outside of this country. And I wanted to, I hoped that I could do something that could reach beyond where I was physically. Um, and so actually pharma allowed me to do that, right? Because we make drugs on a large scale. And I've always been at pretty large companies um, and so have had the opportunity and have been lucky to see vaccines and drugs go to the end and be approved and then be licensed and then be recommended for use in the populations that needed them. Um, so it was really just keeping the thread of what I'd like to do um, and, and it I found my way. I don't think anybody should sort of have a straight line. Life doesn't work that way. And I think you miss opportunities. So I, when I talk to people, I say, figure out what you like um, and build your job and your career around what you like. Um, and so I've been lucky I've been able to do that. And, you know, so far, so good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love that compass. And uh, we're we're just about to wrap up for this session. But my last question for you, Dr. Absalon, is is there a, a slogan or a motivational phrase that you would go to in terms of uh, day to day going forward in your career facing those challenges? What what would that piece of advice be? My, my branding that I don't have. Um, I think I, I just honestly, I just keep going. I just keep going. It's it's not a hashtag, but it, <laughs> but I just keep going. And I think if for me, it really is about contributing to healthcare, and making it better for people. Um, and I, with that, I'm able to block out some of the noise. Um, I generally enjoy my work, um, and I just want to continue to contribute. So I just keep going. All right. Hashtag keep going is a, is a great <laughs> note to, to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Ju Judy Epsilon, for being with us today and, and sharing your, your personal journey and all of those powerful insights that I'm sure our, our audience are going to take away and uh, flourish <laughs> in their careers. Thank you, Faye. And thank you for um, the society for inviting me to speak today. All right. Make sure to, to tune in for our next session at the Rosalind Franklin Society virtual event. Take care. Welcome to our next session of the Inspiring Women Transforming Science virtual event. My name is Phelan, Senior Editor at Gen Biotechnology, Gen's sister peer-reviewed journal publishing outstanding original research and perspectives across the biotech field. It's my pleasure to be moderating this session and introduce our guest, Cassandra Wesselman. Cassandra is an impassioned advocate for patient-centered care and bridging clinical practice and genomic di discovery. She is chief marketing officer at Rosalind and is a founding member of the Council of Corporate Leadership at the Rosalind Franklin Society. After serving as chief communications officer for six years at Rosalind, Cassandra went on to launch the Clinical Solutions Business Unit to focus on the bench-to-bedside benefits of translational research. We're thrilled to have her speak today. Cassandra, how are you doing? The floor is yours. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for those listening in and attending. Thank you to all of the speakers at this amazing annual event that I look forward to every year. I'm very, very happy to be here. So today, 
I would love to have the opportunity to share some of my experiences recently being uh, an empowered woman executive in the field of STEM in, in life sciences. I've spent about a decade with this field, have gone through some amazing opportunities, moving up the ladders, but also seeing along the journey of being a woman and minority in science, that there's a long ways we have to go to bring equality and equalization to the playing field here. Uh, so with this conversation that I'd love to have today, I wanted to shine some light on some opportunities that I've seen along the way and along this journey, specifically with the Rosalind Franklin Society. As mentioned in my bio, I was approached in 2020 by Carla and the Rosalind Franklin Society to launch um, an amazing initiative for this Council of Corporate Leadership. And I've been a very strong advocate in sharing whenever I speak to anybody in the field, just what's available and being a part of such a council and um, just taking that time to, to share from my heart space and, and what I've seen in this journey, I thought would be a really good point to start. So if it's okay with you, Faye, I'd like to kind of share uh, from that place and, and see if I can inspire some other women in learning from my story of how I got to be where I am in my field, as well as maybe guide through where things could end up for others that are interested in, in corporate leadership, specifically in life sciences. Absolutely. We're very excited to hear about your experiences and looking forward to having a great discussion after your talk as well. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. So, um, when when I was approached by the Ross and Frank Society a few years ago, uh, I have to admit, I almost had a tear come to my eye. Um, as might have been seen in my bio, there's a company I work with that I help co-found called Rosalind. And as many of you who are attending this event know, it's to pay homage to the Rosalind Franklin, um, amazing person in our history, history um, who made such an immense contribution to our field and did not have recognition for some of her work, um, probably as much as she should have had. And it brought a tear to my eye because corporate leadership has an immense opportunity to really make the invisible visible, to really uplift women, minorities, underrepresented, um, where places may not have attribution to proper uh, role, key role players in our field. And having a council, just like the very esteemed Council of Academic Leadership, really pay more attention to corporate leadership where so much impact can be made on the corporate level um, was really inspiring to me that it was being founded and it was being upstarted, especially during a, a time like COVID. Um, obviously that was a very influx time for a lot of people. And uh, it seemed like a, a really great chance to have a, a vehicle for, for spreading some amazing words and awareness on where things might be imbalanced or where things might not have proper representation. Um, and with the work I was doing at the time during COVID, um, specifically working with the NIH, specifically working with diagnostic surveillance uh, and realizing that in a lot of cases, there were these amazing women that I was working alongside as we know, with the, the vaccine work and those efforts in the more recent Nobel Peace Prize that was won, um, there was some just amazing contributions that women were making in science. So while the voices were being heard, um, there's still a conversation about equality and it's still a conversation about balance, um, specifically around salary and wages and representation of women in our field as a whole. Um, it's still the case that average annual sal salaries for STEM are nearly $15,000 or less on average per year for Latina and African-American women in our field. Um, and overall, as women, you'll see that it's about $33,000 on average compared to men and women in salary imbalances. Uh, and I, I look at these numbers and I just, knowing has much of an equal contribution that we're making. Um, seeing that inequality has really been a, 
a sore spot for me. Uh, and even being in a, in a role, in a chief role in my organization and knowing the impact I can make on employee salaries and balancing the playing field and hiring in with that understanding that we need to have more representation of these extraordinary people coming through our universities. I mean, it's still the case that we're having a very high, if not almost a majority of representation uh, of women in, in the STEM field these days. Not quite computer science, which is my field specifically. Uh, Rosalind is a, is a computer software, software as a service. But in, in science, um, we are seeing that it's, it's tipping over 50% women in our field. And just allowing that there to be that proper representation in our employee workforce, as well as along the ladder of leadership and really empowering these women and uplifting them, um, giving them their space, a lab of their own, giving them the opportunity to flourish. It's really our, our purpose as leaders in life sciences to do that. Um, and in this journey, this conversation of the, of the journey I've made, We've also had some amazing award ceremony opportunities to shine more light at places like AGBT with the Women Changing Science Awards that we co-hosted last year. Um, if I could tell you just how ecstatic people were that there was a platform to honor specifically women minorities in our field at a place like AGBT, um, you know, the hundred or so people that were in that very intimate award ceremony, um, nobody walked out of that room without saying that it needed to be happening more, it needed to be happening in a larger scale in the follow on years, because it's just important uh, to really shine light on some of this great work, um, paying homage to that, that immense effort that women and minorities are making in our field where they might not be represented as doing such. So that that's where the, just sharing from my heart why I was so esteemed when in a static when um, this concept of the Council of Corporate Leadership came through um, as an invitation from the Ross and Franklin Society and how we can uplift those voices and how we can be a representation for that corporate leadership and really start equalizing things where we see that there could be those opportunities. Um, going on to talk about just specifically Rosalind Franklin, um, I'm a big fan of her. Uh, read every book I think there is written on her so far, all the ones that have even been coming out more recently. Um, but there's a, a really great story that I was telling Carla the other day. Um, and my husband, who I, I work with, was just adamant that I, I, I share this fun story um, with you all here in this session, because I think there's a lot we don't know even about her life and her family. Um, and really, how things are still left to this day about her life and her family. Um, I was uh, I was in Los Angeles and I was searching for a place to have a birthday party for a friend of mine. And I was introduced to somebody who wanted to allow for this birthday party to happen at their house. And it was this man that I spoke to on the phone and he had an English accent. And honestly, at first I thought it was Australian because I wasn't really picking up on it correctly, but he happened to have been from the UK. Um, and so I go to his home and it's this beautiful home in the Hollywood Hills and he's a photographer. And we spend, you know, an hour or two just talking about life, talking about things in general. And he's got some really amazing background about what he's done and all this amazing photography work he's done. And then he asked about what I did. And I mentioned that I, you know, I, I work with software that looks at DNA and does multiomic analysis. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, DNA, you know, DNA. And he's like, oh, I know what DNA is. Um, my, my aunt, she, she's very well known, my aunt Rosalind. And <laughs> I nearly fell out of my chair, almost blacked out because it turned out his aunt was Rosalind Franklin. And I... I Obviously, he knew that I was really in shock and he was confused at first. And he, he asked me if I knew who Rosalind Franklin was. And I, of course, I said, yeah, I named my company after her. And he started crying. Um, he knew that his, his aunt had some fame and had some well-known aspects to the work that she brought to the world. Uh, but 
I guess he wasn't really clear just how much of respect and honor um, that people in the world felt were needed to have with her. She was a very important person in our history. And I know there's many different aspects and perspectives and opinions on how things came to be and who gave what information to who and how much information was known. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, when you look at that Nobel Peace Prize, her name's not on it. Um, and yes, there's obviously reasons, you know, posting this, you can't assign that, but um, there's a lot that's left untold in the story. And luckily we have our children in school learning more about her, but 20 years ago, maybe that name wasn't really recognized as, as being one of those big contributors. And what became clear to him in that moment is that people are starting to tell her story and people are starting to recognize her. And I can just say that when he spoke about his aunt, he was glowing as a, a schoolboy. He was talking about just how much she loved her work, how much she loved the world, how much she loved nature and life. And even though he was eight or nine years old, when he knew her, because she lived with him in her last years um, when she fell ill with cancer, um, he definitely made it known that he was, you know, her favorite family member, but just how much she really had a, a perspective of life that really sat with him for his full life continuing on. And um, it, it was really an experience for him to, to listen and, and hear me talk about her and then we went out to dinner with some others who also learned about her for the first time, you know, <laughs> which was surprising to me still, but, you know, at least we're starting to, to speak her name more often. Uh, so I just wanted to share that story because it, it happened just in the last few months. And it was one of those um, amazing, you know, serendipity moments that you just appreciate in life um, and really kind of helped reinstill my belief of, of just really making the invisible visible, really bringing that attention to where it's needed so that we can make attributions where they're due. Um, you know, with the work that I did in COVID during that time period um, and the, the feed of Gizaid, which is the sequencing data I was working with, there was a lot of attention on attribution to those labs, um, to where the hard work was being done. You know, if anything was being used with that special data, with that, even though we couldn't talk about the individual participant data, obviously it was de-identified, but really giving that attribution to the lab and that work. Um, it was really great to know that as, you know, as a life sciences industry that, um, we are starting to and, and continue to pay attribution where it's due and, and just recognize how important that is. Um, of course, it goes without saying with scientific research, just how much we really pay respect to our past work and those stepping stones that we make in our industry being known along the way. Um, eventually, hopefully we can get so far as understanding on the, the participant level, as we know with people like Henrietta Lacks, knowing where the true attribution is to even people who give and give and give with their, their own data, their own live data. Um, we're starting to go down those paths and it's, it's, really, it's really exciting. It's a very exciting time to be in this industry. Uh, so I just wanted to take a moment and just share on, on specifically that. Um, raising awareness is so key right now as this world is changing, as things are happening on the planet. Um, a lot of things unknown, a lot of things that are questionable, but really staying true that science, everyday life, it really can't be separated, that we really need to be focused on that experiment, that experiment experience, and uh, knowing where our data is coming from and keeping it human and keeping it true. Um, it's, it's very exciting, the world we live in today. Uh, so that's what I wanted to take a few moments and share about. And I hope you enjoyed hearing that fun little story and tidbit and learning about the Rosalind Franklin Society. 
and about the Council of Corporate Leadership. And for those of you in the audience that do have that role in your organization of leadership and you're looking to contribute and participate and be a part of an amazing council that couldn't do some extraordinary work on raising the bar and raising that awareness. Uh, we'd love to have you. We'd love to learn more about what you're working on and to bring you into this wonderful council that Carla and others at the society have started. Uh, so that's what I wanted to share today. And I appreciate the time and giving me the space to uh, to share about it, Vey. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, for sharing one such a heartfelt, serendipitous story mm -hmm. and also your your insights and, and passions for this very important field. And I'm excited to have a, a bit of a, a discussion on some of these important topics. And you've done such a great job emphasizing a lot of these disparities and, and gaps that we see in in these industries, for example, salary being a, a main one. I'm wondering what sort of action items can the community do to address some of these really key disparities that you've highlighted, whether it be uh, things that the council is doing, if folks want to get involved, as you mentioned, or just folks in the industry in their various roles, what, what are some things that they can do to push the needle forward? Yeah, it's definitely speaking up. It's leaning in. It's making sure that there's action and there's conversation and there's fearlessness in having the uncomfortable conversations, being that person that's uplifting those others that are around us that could use that extra help and support and scaffolding or whatever you want to call it to come up to those those places where they really need to be so it's it's being that fearless leader that we really need to be in our time right now joining places like the council corporate leadership having the conversation having sounding boards there's other groups like Chief and Women's Networking Events, and I'm sure there's other places in the life sciences where we can gather and we can have these conversations and set some standards and, and at least have those open conversations. If there's question about what is standard or what is practiced and how we can <clears throat> learn from each other. So coming to the table, having that fearlessness to have those uncomfortable conversations and also joining communities and, and councils and collaborative spaces to have those conversations, I think is a really great starting point. So I would just say that, just fearlessness. And Cassandra, you've been such a great example of that fearlessness in, in your own advocacy. I'm curious for you personally, how did you get into first going into STEM and then also going into this adv advocacy aspect of STEM for others who would be interested in following a similar path yeah, I started off my my degree at, in school was in neuroscience. So I started off in a, in a very scientific field. Um, I wanted to really focus in business. I did see early on that as much as I could be in the lab and enjoy the work there, um, that a lot of the, the big impact also needed to be had in the business sense of, of how the bottom line specifically was where I was focused on, but really um, having a, a better practice on doing things with integrity and with transparency and focusing on places and ways that we can make the world better and do better business. Um, that's why I, I went on to, to do my degree with my master's. Um, as much as I love, like I said, being in that, that world and being in the lab and doing my scientific theories and hypotheses, um, it just felt like the best move for me. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to join up with my husband uh, and start this company that focused on bioinformatics, um, this was at a time when we were just learning about the opportunities with precision medicine and personalized health, right? And, and really knowing that it's going to take a knowingness of ourselves on a population scale, as well as on that individual, individual scale, um, to know how to do things better, and therapeutics and diagnostics and how to get to 
answers faster. Um, so taking where I went to school, taking from the opportunity that we were in that moment, you know, 10, 15 years ago with the Obama administration and the initiatives around precision health, um, it really was a perfect opportunity. So I'm, I'm grateful and I, I love what I do and I love working in this field with those opportunities. Yeah, building on this idea of pursuing and, and building your own career path, a common topic aligned with that is also community mentorship and, and having that support. And so for your specific story, were there specific mentors that uh, helped you pave the way forward or what advice would you have for folks looking to find that support? Yeah, I have had some extraordinary women. Um, I've had some extraordinary mentors along the way. Like I mentioned a few groups like Chief, um, like the Rosalind Franklin Society. Um, there's other groups that you would find in New England and women's groups all over the place and, and minorities and science groups. Um, definitely joining those types of environments. A lot of experiences of uplifting each other of, of like I said having those uncomfortable conversations or just getting awareness of, of what is a common practice even if it's not within your organization how we can learn from each other those happen in those beautiful collaborative sessions in those core groups um, it's always a great opportunity uh, to learn from those types of environments and and having those mentors if you have access um, by professors, in school, I've had some extraordinary professors that I've maintained close relations with even 10, 15 years later. Um, so those of you in the audience that might be in school working on you know, your degree right now, um, these are the relationships that are going to last your lifetime if you so choose. And I, I highly recommend just maintaining that because I, I've, I've leaned on some of my professors even to this day, like I said, 15 years later. Um, and they're very special to me. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's finding those those groups and those places where we can learn from each other that are really key. You also mentioned your focus lies in in bioinformatics, more of the computational science sciences. And given that we all know there are still big gaps in representation across the science sciences, but especially in the computational sciences. <laughs> what have your experiences been as a, a woman in, the, in this space? And are there specific challenges that have been brought up? And what advice would you give to folks? Yeah, well, we're still uncovering so much. There's still so much opportunity in technology. Um, computer science is a very um, small representative of women currently um, in terms of you know graduates if you look through the programs and what those graduation rates are it's a lot small I mean STEM overall we're actually doing really good but in computer science it's actually very low um, I really hang my hat on that we have a 40 percent women representation on our computer science team and our engineers uh, it takes a conscious effort to really uplift women in, in our space, specifically within our organization. Um, it's amazing when you can walk through the office and you have high school kids, because we, we do sessions where we have high school programs come through our school, uh, come through our, our, our office, you know, as a classroom or as a, as a summer program, for example. Um, and you see, you know, this office filled with women doing computer science and the, the students just are blown away. Um, the number of internship opportunities I've been asked for and, and um, just inspiring um, experiences that these, these youths have by seeing, I can look like me and I can sit in that chair and do coding and do engineer work and, and, and really unlock these really exciting discoveries you know, at my computer and, and, and doing where I look online and I look at TikTok videos or Instagram videos and it's all men talking about these jokes or these video postings about coding. Um, I can be a woman and, and then be in that ex in, uh, employment opportunity. Um, it's been really great. It was, it was obviously, you know, challenging. I was 
the only woman, you know, early on in, in our organization for a good minute there. Um, and when we started hiring more engineers, it was it was really great that we had these amazing candidate pools of women that were able to come in. Um, you know, in business, um, I also have some experience with investment banking. Um, that's kind of where I went in the life sciences. I kind of took that little turn in investment banking, wanted to learn how to raise money before I started doing my own business. Um, and I was always the only woman in the boardroom, always. And it was awkward not being the woman in the boardroom just taking notes. Um, we definitely have a long way to go. And I know there's conscious effort of hiring purposefully in the boards for women. There's actually an active proactive effort to seek women specifically and leaving that chair for a woman. There's, you know, pluses or minuses for doing that. If it's just a checkbox, obviously that's not what you do it for. Um, but we still have a, a long ways to go is, is what I'm trying to say. It, you can still, it's palpable, um, the, the difference that still exists, even to this day, even though we're taking that proactive effort. Um, so you ask about, you know, where I've seen the, the challenges and that's, that has been one, I'm not, I'm not going to say otherwise. Um, it's uncomfortable at times, but again, you have to be fearless and you have to step up and you have to uplift those around us so that it's no longer a disparity. It's no longer a, a difference. Um, it shouldn't be, obviously. We're just about to wrap up for this session. Mm -hmm. And the last question I want to ask you, Cassandra, is do you have a, a motto or a slogan that uh, motivates you to keep going on your endeavors and something that to to bring to our audience to uh, get them off um, and on to their careers? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's the common one I always love to say is don't let perfection get in the way of progress, right? It's, I'm a perfectionist. So get out of your own way and just kind of go for it. But I really, I like a new one that's come to me recently. Um, I did a lot of work, you know, starting up this business and I've worked with startups in the past and there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, but something that I've, I've liked to tell myself recently these days is chaos is the opportunity for opportunities. You really have to embrace it and not let it get the best of you and not let you become fearful or, you know, fear and uncertainty, just get it out of the way. Like it's, it's an opportunity, challenges, chaos, there's just opportunity there if you really look for it. Uh, and that's been really helping me along my journey. And I hope that helps inspire people to see through those challenging moments and see the opportunities in anything that comes in your way. I love that leaning into uncertainty and really taking advantage of, of all the opportunities as they, as they come. It's fantastic. All right. Thank you, Cassandra Wesselman for this fantastic conversation. Thank you to the audience for joining in this session of the Inspiring Women Transforming Science virtual event. We're very excited to have this fantastic lineup and we'll see you next time.